find that way in Excel. Yeah. All right. yeah. So it is one o'clock right about now. Enough people are filed, and I think we're good. You guys ready to start the D20 Live RPG 101 panel? Woo! Ah! Slow down. No, 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 no. You're better than that. You got to warm up for tonight. Are you ready? Yeah. Excellent. Ooh, microphone works. What? Yeah, it's good. Oh. So um, I have gathered together two of the finest GMs I know and myself to answer your questions uh, about RPG stuff and all that stuff. Whatever you might have questions about, man, am I on heavy medication? <laughs> I'm gonna out to them so they can introduce themselves. Bank. You're, you're okay. I'm fine. Yeah. The ducks, the ducks in the front row are yelling at me. Keep doing that. Honestly, no, no, no. Keep, keep doing that throughout the panel. Randomly give out quacks. <laughs> Just make it like a Mighty Ducks movie. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Derek, do you want to go first? Quack. 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 Are you guys ducks or what? <laughs> Derek, you're a dick. Uh, I'm, I'm Derek the Bard from Jason Muse and Terrible Warriors. I have been playing RPGs since I was 10 years old, so for about 22 years now. Um, I have run LARP games, I've done every type of RPG under the sun, and I don't know what else to say. Um, how about your favorite RPG system? Oh, oh, we don't have to go into like the questions yet. Just introduce ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> introduce yourself. I got to think on this one. <laughs> you don't do it often enough. No, it's not, it's just that storyteller isn't my favorite system. Okay, fair. <laughs> um, my name is Devin Sherman. I am co-GM for D20 Live. I've been uh, GMing for about 18 years. I've only played five games, but I've GMed about 13, 14 campaigns. So that's mostly what I'll be talking about. Not so much playing role-playing as running games, being a GM for games, that sort of thing is what I'll be adding to this panel. Um, I've had the pleasure of killing several of Mike's characters over the years. Uh, I also had the pleasure of introducing Fuzzy Bridges to the larger D20 Live universe. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Fuzzy Bridges. And, uh, and uh, my favorite system is Legend of the Five Rings. Uh, yeah, and I'm Big Mike. I'm the guy who runs D20 Live. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I know what my favorite system is now. What is it? Uh, DC Heroes 3rd Ed by Mayfair Games, 1991. It is still the single best superhero system ever produced. Fair enough. Um, I'm the guy who runs D20 Live. I've been playing pen and paper RPG games since 2002, and I don't count the numbers anymore. You're a dirty casu casual and a newbie. Yeah, I am. Yes. Scroll, you all are. Yeah, I am. And <laughs> I have GM'd both of these men many times, and I wish to do so many more. As for my favorite system, yeah, it's still Exalted 2nd Edition. Second Still second edition. Most result. incomprehensible, what? most detailed possible <laughs> combat system ever created yes. by the hands of man. Do you like fluff? Because they got fluff. <laughs> um, oh, really? So Comparable to Rift? <laughs> so let me tell you about the time I took 15 actions in a single combat round with my exalted how about, PC. How about we answer the people's questions first? <laughs> and we'll see where we go from there. So, who has an RPG question or a regular question? Okay, one guy at the yeah, back to start up. Yeah. Uh, what are the questions you ask yourself when you're designing a campaign setting? Um, is there... Okay, uh, how much is it going to cost it me to buy it from Paizo? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let, let me start with the words, how drunk am I at the time? Um, usually the biggest question I ask myself is, what's going to be the most fun for players to interact with? Yeah. More than anything else. Because the one thing I've found, and I learned it the hard way, as Demon can attest, an RPG... A uh, game that you play through, it's not like a book or and it's not like a movie. It is very much like a video game. It's something that's meant to be experienced. So if you're if you're a GM who starts out, and everyone makes this mistake. It's like I got so many plot points I want to get them through. It never works out. If you have a thing like I've got a dark and gritty city and there's several hookers over there that are demons, <laughs> they will have fun with it and they'll come out a lot better. Uh, I can guarantee you if you do the dark and gritty city and there are several hookers over there who are demons, the PCs will go to a candy shop and start giving candy to orphans just because your players will inevitably hate you. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the best advice I ever got with running a game was act, uh, from my piano teacher when I was 11, uh, who, who was actually the guy who got me into Dungeons and Dragons from playing DC Heroes. Um, and he said, I, I once wrote, and he's telling me this story, he says, I once wrote this super detailed campaign setting, and I, I wrote out the entire city, and like every part of the city possible, except for this one district by the pier, and I figured they're never gonna go there. That's like, that's not just the slums, that's like the slummiest slums. 
So the first thing the PCs do is they say, hmm, there's terrible things happening in the city. We need to go to the slummiest slums. <laughs> and he says, I looked at him, I'm like, are you sure? The PCs are like, yeah, of course, man. We, we, we gotta go to the slummiest slums. It's obviously coming from there. And Olivier looks at me and he says, I have absolutely no idea what happened next. Because I, I just made it up on the spot. Your players will never do what you expect. You have to be able to improvise. And um, I, I can attest from running games for, uh, for Big Mike and uh, other people. I tend to have two pages of notes of just salient things I want to do. And I find ways to integrate them no matter how, what the players do. The plot will find you. <laughs> yeah, whenever I'm designing, so you asked specifically about designing a setting rather than buying one or, or interpreting one, like buying something and changing it for yourself, which is a lot of fun to do. Um, it's, you think of uh, themes or scenes or something that you want to do, uh, cut, just have a quick handful of them, and know that you're not going to get around to them in the way that you expect. They're never going to happen in the campaign when you want them, they're never going to happen how you want them, and the characters that you want to have monologues are never going to be given a chance of having monologues, isn't that right, you asshole? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think it's ever stopped me ever in the history of anything. No, no. <laughs> um, so you come up with certain themes you that you want to deal with, and then what you actually do is very much related to what Derek said. You let it interact with players. I've started doing this with um, a game that I run on Sundays, and I introduce the players to the themes that we're doing, to the setting that we're doing, and they say, okay, I want you to add something to the setting. I want you to give me either a theme or a criminal organization group or something that you interact with and are passionate about. Seed my own setting or see what's your setting. You're running a game with these people, you're creating an interactive story, so you want them to add to it, either at the beginning of the campaign or later on. Because the when I ran Exalted for Mike, the mistake that I made is I had a grand sweeping arc that I wanted to do, and this is where I learned that lesson. And one of the players decided, okay, no, I, I don't interact with what you're doing. I want to go over here, and I will break away from the group every single damn session to interact with this thing. Um, problem players are another thing. But I said, you know what? Instead of making this guy a problem player, that's fine. I'll take what he wants to do, and I'll just roll it into my game. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll work with it, and just make it part of the overall story, which is what I ended up doing. Yeah, it, it's important to keep in mind that an RPG is a cooperative storytelling exercise between yourself as the GM and your players mediated by a randomized mechanic. Um, but it is still essentially you telling stories back and forth. Um, and that's really where an RPG becomes at its best and it, at its most immersive because it's something that we as human beings have been doing literally since we were cavemen. Is gr gathered around a fire telling a story and then someone adds something to it, and then someone else adds something to it. Yeah. Is your microphone still working? Yeah, yeah sporadically. Okay. Then you have it's to a sleep. crappy microphone, and I haven't found the right part of the condenser yet. And you have to sort of swallow the mic. You have you to understand. swallow this mic. Yeah. So, I guess that answers that question. Does anyone have another one? Uh, okay, so we run a D&D &D game at my college. Good luck. <laughs> oh, you poor, poor fool. It's, it's regulated. We, we actually have a really good thing going. We're doing a follow-up campaign right now. Ooh, cool. nice. ballsy. Um, so the issue that we run into is we have a really good friend of ours. We like him. We hang out with him. He's a killer DM. And we don't know how to get out of Dodge. Uh, you mean, like, you want to get out of the game, or do you want to try and fix the game? Uh, we want to try and fix the game, because the game itself is, like, really cool. Like, the Fallout universe is huge and expansive and really cool. But we don't, like, we're... You're kind of just stuck with the... Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you guys have tried talking to him about it. Yeah. And it does, it's not sticking? It, he doesn't get, like... He doesn't understand that he's a killer DM, mm. but... He thinks he's just playing fair at that yeah. point. Okay, so here's what you need to do. You need to take him up for dinner, uh, just you, and the rest of the people, you need to hang a big sign on the wall, and the sign says, Happy Intervention. <laughs> and then you can write down cards. Uh, and I'm actually quite serious, is that one of the things that we often shy away from in RPGs, especially when it's our friends, is telling them when there's a problem. And we avoid it, and we avoid it, and that, that becomes a problem in and of itself. 
and RPGs are best when everyone is frank and open with each other. Now, your your DM is going to keep secrets from you because that's his job to make the story interesting. Players will keep secrets from each other because it makes the story interesting, especially when they're take when they're about to betray people or when they have a big reveal. But the structure of the game. You're basically just playing with yourself. Exactly. Um, the, the structure of the game works best when everyone has a frank and open discussion. And if there are problems, you say so. Um, and it should be, uh, and you, you need to make clear that within, that you're not being accusatory. Within this room, we're, we're all friends, and we're all trying to make the story better. But sometimes that means pointing out flaws in the way the story is told, and working to make them better. And if you don't make that kind of headway, you can always just min-max the hell out of your characters and cheat that way. <laughs> I, don't I, don't, I don't recommend that, because that usually breaks down cohesion, but like Derek said, just it's usually best to try and have one-on-ones, not to supplement anything you were saying, because that's all really good stuff. But, yeah, just... Happy intervention! Yeah, just happy intervention. I have no idea. Just don't pull ahead I've never played any Fallout gaming. Uh, okay, all you do in Fallout is you max out your strength and your endurance, <laughs> and you buy Malian Unarmed, and then you just go around punching people's heads off. <laughs> Pretty much. Or you max out your long distance shooting and laugh at the universe. <laughs> with like, what, just one type of weapon and just put all your points into that weapon. Stupid and just me really. became a fucking medic. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are, no, you are valuable in a Fallout oh, universe. You're just not, get better at being a medic so that he can't kill anybody. That's the trick. <laughs> and then just get Malia and stab people with scalpels. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I have a character named Dr. Stab Stab. <laughs> So I had charisma and seduce the super mutant. That works too. <laughs> I had one of my players uh, address this in a different sort of way. Um, I was the opposite for a long time, where I did want to kill my players specifically because I wa I wanted them to enjoy seeing their character fulfill itself, like see the idea that their character what their character is going to be. So I would regularly fudge my dice rolls to not kill them if I didn't feel it was uh, story appropriate. I had one of my players approach me and say, okay. I want a different kind of fun, and you can read it. You can whenever you take your GM out and have this have this discussion, you can approach it in this way. Like seeing characters die and seeing characters die in horrible ways, like falling down a fire pit with horse traps and so forth, is a lot of fun. But you want to experience something different with the game, and don't be accusatory, as Derek said. Just say you want to try something different. I want to see where my character's arc will go, and. By that extension, you need to stay alive. <laughs> so it's just one of those. You're you're having fun, but you want to try something different. You want to try approaching the story from a different perspective and approach the game from a different angle. That way, they're not taking offense to it, and they're sort of collaboratively working with you to make the game better. Okay. Anyone have another question? Um, who is next? I can't. Starfleet guy. Starfleet. How do you deal with a uh, complete campaign derailment? Let it go. <laughs> Let it go completely. I've had players waste half an hour in a bathroom. <laughs> okay. So, I, 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 honestly, oh, like, no, yeah, sorry, no, I got a little done. Yeah, if because here's the thing: if the players have completely derailed your game, there's two things you got to keep in mind. One, they have you have actually achieved your goal because you have found something that they wish to interact with. It wasn't the thing you intended, but it's still something within your world. Two, if there is a big, scary evil out there, it's going to come looking for them eventually. <laughs> let it grow. Let the timeline go in the absence of what they're doing, and let them interact with that, because they have chosen a part of your world to play with. And that's the point. Having fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I mean, here's the thing. Part of your job is also just to make sure that people have a good time. And if the plot goes off the rails... We, uh, I, I ran a game where my players spent an hour in Pugmire trying to fight three cats. Because one of the cats kept re rolling. Pugmire's a game with anthropomorphic dogs and cats in a post-apocalyptic future that's kind of like Adventure Time. Um, and they get ambushed by cat bandits. And one of the cat bandits just keeps rolling really, really well. And keeps, like, hiding under one of their horses. Q seven rounds of combat where they're just trying to get the cat out from under the horse. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god. I have to do something about this cat because the game is becoming dangerously close to derailing over just, we got to kill this cat now. He's our arch nemesis. <laughs> Guys, the game isn't about that cat. It's about another cat. He is the final boss. <laughs> the final boss was my cat. And then Shane rolled a natural 20 and killed my cat. <laughs> Don't make your pets the main villain. <laughs> Why would you do that? In, 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 
Before Mike goes on, I just want to say in defense of the bathroom scenario, it was a lot of fun to have a fantasy character interact with what a toilet is. <laughs> Yeah, well, if you guys want us just to tell stories, we'll do that at the end. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, but no, 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 that was fine, because you were giving me an example. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. just, I'm just not going to explain this one, because that would take too long. Uh, any other questions? I was one and two, but here first. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so my question is, I hear a lot about what Devin does. Mm -hmm. So he tends to add voices, extra side things, like paper. Yeah, it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> It's annoying when you GM with him and he keeps making you go your bar up and he vomits up blood. That was awesome. I heard about it and it was pretty awesome. Yeah, it was I awesome. Was yeah, I had to clean up the tray he vomited yes. blood up on. I think anyway, so. we're so the question is, yeah. how often is that important to how you guys GM? I know Devin does it, but do you do that often? As like a no. Thing he, he doesn't do voices. Um, Except for Nauticus. <laughs> it's a horrible lie. You do voices all the time. Yeah. Still do things. Um, it's it's up to you. Uh, the question was like, how often do you throw in extra fills, like different voices for NPCs or props or costumes or music? That's up to you. Don't. My best ex my best advice is don't overextend yourself before when you get started. Um, play characters that you can play NPCs that you not necessarily can do the voices of, but you can let their mannerisms channel through you, and they're easy to be differentiated. And as you go on, add things that you feel you can do safely without endangering yourself. Devin, in this story, decided to carry a, what was it, a blood pellet in your mouth for like an hour? <laughs> during an RPG session, and then all of a sudden, halfway through the session, he starts vomiting up blood in front of us as the DM. It's like, what happened? The king is dying. No shit, are you okay? That was the point. I immersed the characters. They thought I was in a lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> And That's just, hardcore. Your commitment to sparkle motion is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks for the idea. Um, I, I always use different mind. voices for my NPCs. Uh, I find it differentiates between NPCs. I admit a lot of NPCs of a certain type receive the exact same voice. I have one mafia voice and I use it for everything. <laughs> or any organized crime character, it doesn't matter whether they're Italian, Japanese, Russian, Chinese, Indonesian, Nigerian, South African, Peruvian, they all sound like extras from The Godfather. <laughs> yeah, see? I, I, have a, yeah, I have a Scottish accent that I substitute for absolutely everything else. <laughs> Demonstration! <laughs> <laughs> no, during story time. <laughs> um, before I get no worries. Um, yeah, and I, and right now, for example, we're playing uh, Regime Diablique, which is entirely set in Mus Three Musketeers, France. I am not using a French accent for every single NPC. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. How uh, many people can you have talk like this? <laughs> but uh, why not? It's a very simple like, accent to do, eh? Fairly evil mustache. Mwah, ha, ha, ha. Oh, you could just talk like you are from Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> Every NPC is from Quebec. <laughs> Next question. It's it's about um, as I said, gradually building uh, what I the, just what I call skill set. It's um, I didn't I don't I didn't do that at the start. It, what I started with was just music. Because it was for me, it was the experience of being a GM. The job of a GM is creating immersion for my players. Uh, I know I can't do voices terribly well. As I said, I really only have one accent. So how else do I bring them in? I started with music, and then I started doing other things. Like, okay, what if I do props? I've done a lot of crafting before, so how can I add this in? During our pirate campaign, I added in uh, a map for the for the open ocean. Uh, the uh, the the coughing up of the blood for King Uther's death was just how do I make this immersive for them and make them remember these sort of high emotional moments. And you grow your skill set. You introduce it slowly because you don't want to... It, it runs the risk of derailing the entire experience with too many props or music yeah. that doesn't fit the setting or sound effects that don't randomly fit the setting. Um, you want to introduce it gradually, get your players used to it, and then slowly introduce new tools uh, into it as you go. And even and even have that conversation. There's a reason I don't do miniatures right now, because this game group doesn't like it. I have another game group that does. So we had that conversation, had that collaborative uh, discussion, and added that in afterwards. Devin, I just want to point out that you said a boot. A boot? You said a boot. He did say a boot. I am. You, you super Canadian then. <laughs> Puts in. Next question? Uh, who's next? That John. That John? Okay. 
How do you deal with uh, characters who are uh, characters and players who are being suicidally reckless in order to bait the DM? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, am that player. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what well, shuts you down? <laughs> uh, what stops me? Uh, he can kill me whenever he wants. It's yeah. just too entertaining to let me live. Yeah. <laughs> um, as, as someone who plays the suicidal players more often than not, just because that's how I detox, because when I DM, I'm very formal and very proper. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> when I DM here, I'm formal, and not even you guys are going to believe that. Anyway, <laughs> when I DM, like I'm kind of just in the zone, I'm very serious about all the details and stuff. When I play, I don't give a crap, and I lose, I just go nuts. So I don't yeah. care whether my characters live or die, except in Pendragon, Doku Kill Arcade. <laughs> <laughs> I have investments in this man. Anyway, um, just if you have a character who's suicidal, right. Um, if you have a character, a player who's playing suicidal characters, they're okay with dying. I can yeah. speak from that as a, they are okay with dying. They expect, they're not doing it, as I've experienced from my own perspective, being that kind of player, they're not doing it to be deter, de, uh, to deter from the story or anything like that. They're just doing that live fast, die hard, die cool. A good looking corpse. Yeah. Well, um, yes and no. Suicidal PCs yeah. can sometimes um, show players uh, it revealed that a player is not having a lot of fun, or that they're not having that they're having a lot of trouble coming up with a concept that really sticks for them. Um, I know a lot of people, especially in LARP, will have these really, really short-run, self-destructing characters because they have a great concept, um, but they start playing them and they find that they don't execute well with the group, and that that just uh, and sometimes that can be solved with a frank discussion with the player. Sometimes it's a player trying to call your bluff on how deadly the situation is. Um, and I've had guys do that. It's like, I, I want to stick around as the cavern collapses and steals the treasure. I'm like, dude, you know the cavern's collapsing, right? No, no, I, I think I can get the treasure. Okay, give me a dex check. Oh, look, you failed, you're dead. Or sometimes they just don't know where to go with the character. Yeah, uh, they, they and, no and, yeah well, that's what I'm saying. Is sometimes they'll, they'll play a couple sessions and they'll play the character out as far as yeah. they can tell. Uh, and sometimes that's natural. Sometimes you find that you've played out the story with, written within your concept and you can't think of where to go from there. And if you as the player, some of the onus is on you to talk to your GM about that and say, man, I'm not having as much fun. I think I played out the story I was looking to tell. And your GM, this actually happened to me the other day with, a, with uh, my LARP ST. I said, look, I'm not having as much fun with this character anymore. I'm having some issues with him. Do you have any suggestions? And he said, yeah, I have this great idea for you. And he spent an hour telling me about where he thought my story could go. And I'm like, oh my god, I never thought of it from that angle. And that's part of that open and frank discussion between player and GM that, make, that can make a game so good, and the lack of it can break the game. They, uh... A lot of the time, but when a player also is suicidal, it's because they you, they're using the game to have fun, but not beyond have fun. Relax, like chill out from their very stressful life, and that's totally okay. That's what you're supposed to be doing. But I have as a player, not not Mike's group, a group that I get together with, like maybe once every one or two months. Um, they had long-standing, like consistent characters that they were growing, and then one player had a really shitty week at work. And he came to the game with that shitty mindset, didn't talk to me about it, didn't de-stress with drinks or what have you. And then whenever he got to the game, he sat down and the romantic like triangle that he had going on with uh, the wife of one of the other players, he decided, no, I'm going to duel you. I'm done with this. And he draws his sword. I'm like, w w what are you doing? Uh, and he challenged him to a duel and ends up killing the other PC and the players are just kind of sitting there going, what the, what just happened? What? what? And... He realized, oh, I have, I have dishonored myself, and he committed seppuku. So now two players did it because he had a shitty week and didn't talk to me about it. Um, I ended up rewinding that and redoing the game once he calmed down. But often it's about getting attention or relaxing after your week. You have to have that discussion with your player if yep. they see that happening. It's like, okay, what's up? Are you cool? You had a bad week at work, or <laughs> they break yeah. up with your boyfriend, girlfriend. It, they just have that discussion with them. It, it's important. It, it's very doable and actually very recommended. Um, yeah. And I've been seeing this. Um, my friend did a thing called Magiscola, which is this Nordic style live action Harry Potter LARP. I have a lot of friends who went to that. Oh, oh dude, Fox friends. talks nothing about it, but Magiscola these days. Nice. Right? And he was explaining it to me. He says, look, before the game, we workshopped our characters every single day. Um, every day after lunch and dinner, we got together out of character and we said, okay, what are we having fun with? What are you not having fun with? 
How can we help that go forward? And having those kind of discussions with your players before and after each game can be a huge asset to uh, increasing the overall enjoyment of the game. Because people feel that they're being heard, and people feel that they're contributed that they can contribute something, and everybody is on the same page. And to make sure you facilitate the opportunities for that, it's not just after the game. Like, it's actually something that we just said about talking to players. That's part of what's in the session advice for GMs for the new Seventh C Second Edition. That's a very good system. Yeah, history the end. Finding different ways to facilitate that. Like I, I have uh, one of my players for our Exalted game, he realized that he was causing a problem, but didn't want to talk about it in front of our friends. So I said, okay guys, here, like, give me feedback. How did you enjoy the session? What did you enjoy about it? Uh, let's have war stories, kind of like the Derek's the LARP, so that that whole war story decompression after the after the LARP yeah. event, so you can uh, like get back in your own headspace. But uh, say, and if you guys don't want to talk about it now, call me later. Or email me, yeah. Or do it like f facilitate some way for them to get their feedback to you uh, in whatever way makes them comfortable. In my case, it was a it was a phone call, and have it to, and have it that way. That's Chris's panel. Okay, <laughs> I can Kool Aid man that room if you want. No, it's good. <laughs> All right. So more right questions. Who's next? <laughs> uh, Who's next? I believe it was just the lady. Okay, we'll start. Oh yeah, we'll just do it. So it's sort of in the same. Uh, having problems with DMs and players. We had two in the same campaign. Uh, one was a new guy who wanted to kill everybody in our campaign immediately because he didn't get along with us. And the other was a problem because he was, he's all of our friend. And he wanted us to go on a suicide mission to save an artifact that someone took from him. And his ex explanation to our characters was, we'll just re-roll. And he wouldn't let it go and he threw it a big fit and hasn't talked to us since. So I'm just wondering how you deal with especially friends who just lose it when people won't do what they want. Do we want to go into um, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize this one really quickly. If you can, um, The problem is with the, the problem player problem is it's not a problem with the player, it's a problem usually with the person and how they deal with conflict. Um, usually if you, and especially if you're starting out, if, you, if you're not sure about your group, just one, run quick one-shots. They're just very brief, don't take up a lot of time. And move it and move on. And if you find someone in there who doesn't mesh with the group, just let them go. Because the problem is, it's not even that they're a problem player, they just they don't work with your group. And there's probably a group out there that works really well with them, with that strong personality. It's just not your team. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Um, when it comes to problem players, the simple fact of the matter is that you want to RP with people you are comfortable RPing with and that have a similar RPing style to you. And if someone, if you have to ask some, tell someone we're not really meshing, that's okay. And that's part of that open discussion because we need to be adults about it. And part of that means that we need to be willing to say, dude, it's not working out. I'm sorry, we gotta break up. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm keeping the cat. Um, Put all your dice in the corner there for you. No, but it's... We need to stop being afraid of that because so many games are ruined by not meshing and people not being willing to say anything about it. And that's why groups end up drifting apart eventually, because people start being afraid to come to game because they're not going to have a good time. Yeah, that, that actually happened to me once, and then I got everyone back together with a different game. Yeah. Um, that was actually my advice. Like, yeah. it's, 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 it's Ghostbuster in the back. Well, just to, um, to write out that point. Sorry, yeah. Bringing sorry. it back, actually, um, from a player perspective and looking at a DM question for once. Uh, as someone who's played with a longtime friend who's a DM, and I respect him very fondly, he's great at storytelling, he's great at setting everything up. I find that when something goes awry, he's very quick to kamikaze a campaign and move on to something else. And I also find, even though he's really good at it, he's very quick to lose his interest in something. And I was wondering if you had any suggestion on how we as players can entice our DM to stick to something, work with us, and stop <laughs> just going, fuck it, because he can. <laughs> um. Is there yeah, a way to start okay, yeah, um, that it's good to stick to? You gotta, this is something you guys are going to have to talk about. You've got to find out why he's ditching these. You have to find out why he's ditching these games. It could be 
because there's a, I don't know your friend, I can't comment on him, because it could be just from, he is legitimately getting bored and he wants to just do one shots and you just tell him to do one shots, and then you guys come back to the, and you guys just say, hey, we really liked this one story, let's go. And we've talked it out with him. We've, we've yeah. honestly consistently told him that the stories are really well put together, yeah. so when he just kamikazes a campaign, you can imagine how the whole party gets Of course, of course. Fast. Mm -hmm. And um, he actually did it last week to the point that I said I had to quit his campaigns because I literally couldn't take it anymore. He was kamikazing almost every month. <laughs> I would say stop letting him DM for a while. Yeah. Let, yeah. Him be, let him be a player for a while. Let him relax. That'll help him more than anything. Yeah. One, of the, uh, one of the big mistakes that I made... Yeah, pretend to be me. One of the big mistakes that I made with actually our group was I was running... Um, be right back. Go ahead. <laughs> you, you, you have a tough head. Yeah, I know. This is a dangerous scenario. <laughs> you gotta run out of your like no no get away no, no. well I said as soon as you run uh, I'm going to gain an ego about it. <laughs> There's a difference between swallowing the mic and you know doing other things. Being resident club. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the biggest mistakes I made as a GM with actually our Sunday group was running a game for too long. Uh, there were other players who did, who were yeah genuinely getting sick of it. I think Mike was the only one and Tom was the only one who didn't get sick of it. Uh, they get sick of it, but. After three years, um, I got tired of the game. And right after that, I started going into a new game. Um, I hadn't given myself a break, and storytelling takes a lot out of you. Uh, and I hadn't actually realized that, and I lost interest quickly, and I stopped coming prepared. There were long pauses during the game because I just didn't know what to do, or in a way didn't give a shit. Uh, so once I realized that, and that's a problem, they have to realize it either through the discussion or they themselves realize it. I took a step back and actually asked Mike, can you step up and start GMing? Take breaks with one shots. They, he needs to understand why, and if he's kamikazing, and I've had that before, one of the main reasons is uh, attention and control. <laughs> they like having their play space, and if the GM suddenly is losing control of their play space, the players do something unexpected with it, or they're going a different direction with it, it's like, this is my story. And most would rather just get rid of it than actually work with the players. If that's the case, then you have that discussion with them, saying, and, and you have, and honestly, let him recapture that interest in GMing by letting someone else GM. Just like, well, then just, just take it over. Just yeah. take it over. That's what I told him. I said, if you want to DM, that's fine. But you got to show me what I'm doing here because I can't just roll in the dark. Because if he's, if, yeah, if, he, if he's wanting to destroy fun, then that means he's not having fun himself for some reason. Yeah. So he needs to recapture that fun in some way. I wasn't ready to start running games when I came back from the US, so Mike very kindly said, can you co-GM a game with me? Um, until I got back on my feet and started getting that love for it again. Yeah. So um, if you got, if you want to ask us, you can ask us more questions on Twitter, and we'll carry it on if you don't. Yeah. So uh, who's next? Um, I have a question as a player. Okay. Um, I come from a non-drama background, so okay. like, um, so I kind of have a little hard time getting into character, like, yeah. um. Pretending, like, is there somewhere I can practice that? Like, um, something I can use? Like, I don't play other um, role playing games, computer role playing games, or anything else. So, you're just trying to find a good way to immerse into your character? Yeah, like, um, to sort of up my enjoyments. <laughs> like, evolve um, it, I think that's okay. more. Um, uh, it depends usually on the character you make. What I usually do that really is my cheat, I copy a pre existing character from somewhere else and shove them in. And so it's like, what would it be like if uh, the doctor was in a, uh, um, a Dungeons and Dragons game or something absurd like that? And it's just, it's, you're, it's not the only, yes, Devin, I know, I'm a difficult player. <laughs> Muffin. The doctor was a difficult character. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you just, you're, it's not your concept, it's someone else's, and you're a lot more faithful to that. And as time goes on, you'll start disassembling characters that you like. It's be like, I like this element, I like this element. And you start fleshing out characters. But when, if you're just starting out, just copy a character's personality wholesale and shove them in. Yeah, it is, there's absolutely nothing wrong with, uh, in the same way that writers read and their first stories copy other books, 
Uh, there's nothing wrong with actually taking an anime that you like or a book that you like. My very first LARP character was an almost exact copy of Drizzt, as most young oh, LARPers are. Oh, 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 yeah, right? Yeah. Well, wait, uh, and it's and, and okay, cry to sock. Cry to real <laughs> elf now. <laughs> Um, so that's a different character, but yes, uh, yeah, it's, it's oh, fine. Oh, you played two okay. dark elves. Yes, they both had two swords. I grew up. The other one was more mature. <laughs> <laughs> funny, funny story about Drizzt, in order to give him, when they tried to translate him into the game, in order to give him two swords, they had to multi-class him out of fighter because it was second edition. <laughs> so the only way they could do it was by making him a ranger, and that's why in later books Drizzt becomes a ranger. Because it was the only way that they could properly adapt his stats in the setting. Yeah. Find whatever game you're running, have the conversation with the GM. What kind of setting is this? Is this post-apocalyptic? Is it fantasy? Is it, like, made? Mm. Uh, <laughs> what else do you do? Why not? <laughs> so find the setting, and then find a book that you like, or an anime that you like, that you find the, that a character just grabs you, and that's like, okay, carbon copy that character, as Mike said. Find what you, or find a, a personality traits of that character that you feel comfortable working with, and just play that. Play that. Uh, or alternatively, there are a lot of RPGs based on fully licensed properties. Um, yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, Supernatural, Battlestar Galactica, Star Wars, Wars. Where, uh, yeah, where you could just play as these characters that people are familiar with. And it's not actually a bad place for new gamers to start, um, or, to, for a, or for a GM to start a new group of characters, because these are people that you can watch TV and you already know. And it's a wonderful way to start RPing, actually, because everyone's familiar with it. Everybody knows where they stand. That's why those products sell constantly. They're constantly yeah. making licensed RPG products. Yeah. I mean, we're under the rule. Good writers, yeah, good writers copy, great artists steal. <laughs> Any other questions? We got two more in the back, so let's go with the front yes. and the back. Gentlemen, the gray shirt in the back. Yeah. So, for players, and I guess for GMs as well, who are kind of bad at adapting or improvising the lines that aren't in the script, what would you recommend for practice? Um, keep screwing up. <laughs> yeah, I make I don't make that up. Um, yeah, no, um, and that's okay. <laughs> if you're basing this on like what you've seen in D20 Live, D20 Live comes after a lot of perf uh, practice, and that's yep. a performance piece. I flub so much stuff on my downtime; it's not funny. <laughs> well, it is for him <laughs> because I'll be giving this great speech, and suddenly I'll say, "The duck, no, the king, the king. We're gonna save the king." Black, 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 fine. Don't hold yourself up to some stupid high standard, because as time goes on and you'll immerse more into the character, you will flub those lines less, or it'll become part of your character's personality. But if you're having a relaxed game with friends, no one's going to care, really. No. Um, our buddy Tom White writes... It goes the opposite. Tom writes the most intricate scripts for his NPCs possible, and they are some of the strangest goddamn things you have ever heard in your life. So we're 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 at one game. We're talking to President Obama, and President Obama is giving us this speech about how this evil dinosaur man has become king of all crime, and is now going to take over the world um, by stealing a football stadium, uh, and how football is integral to his plan, and we're staring at him, or like, Tom, just to be clear, this is President Obama speaking? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's this, this script. He, he has another one where, where his explanation for... The problem is, though, if you go into a script and it gets too long, your players will stop you, often in the most ridiculous ways possible. Yes. Uh, Spider Priest starts talking. PC pulls out a gun, shoots them, looks at me as uh, DM. I'm not getting paid to listen to this shit. <laughs> We frequently interrupt Mike's monologues. Yeah, we frequently interrupt Mike's monologues all the time. It, it, he, he, he had a character who was waiting three adventure paths to play, and the moment He's we walked... He's monologuing! Get him! <laughs> it's like, because it, it was one of our players. Walked out, one of, we moved in, we planned what we were going to do, Mike starts monologuing, and you see the player going, one, two, three, four, five, that's a round, fireball! <laughs> It's six seconds. That's the ground. So it's yeah. I don't know. It's five seconds. Uh, six. That's right. All right. Um, next question. There's one back there, and we'll get to you, man. Okay. Oh no. One, two, and then three. Uh, the Vaporeon in the back. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. As 
we had a problem with a person who was exploiting the rules. Okay. Um, to be precise, he he was using the anime dead spell. Okay. And a. Well, uh, what system is this? Um, this is um, third edition. Third end. See, see, no, I, I asked because Pathfinder and Third End are different, Dan. Yes, <laughs> so go ahead. But yeah, um, so he was using anime dead. He was also using a spell called Desecrate Land. Okay. And what Desecrate Land does is it gives you the ability to summon more undead or anime dead. Yeah. The problem was the rules do not explicitly state whether or not the uh, undead go away after the yeah. Land ends. Yeah. And so he was using that to exploit the rule saying he can permanently keep the extra undead. Um, so there's a there's a really good golden rule at the front of every RPG book I've ever read, and it is these rules are not set in stone tablets. They're written on paper. You can change them. You, your DM is the final arbiter of all rules. Yeah, that's what he's there for. Okay. Then, then tell him it doesn't yeah. work. Then if you don't like what he's tell doing, him the tell god him. behind it died and it doesn't work anymore. And, um, and if he argues with you, you say, look, man, I'm the DM. My rules are final. And if he keeps arguing with you, you look at him and say, okay, you're undead, turn on you, and you get eaten. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. The two things I do. One, um, I've had rules arguments before, but all right. In this instance, in this game, in this evening, it's going to work this way because I'm the GM and I say so. But we can have a discussion about it afterwards because you don't want to be yep. looking yeah. through Google for whatever the answer is. Two, as a GM, advice one, advice one person or another, let him do it. Have the undead lose control, and then have a neighboring kingdom come in and kill all that undead because you're jamming your control oh, of the story. I like that. Uh, and say, okay, well, now you've started a war because you this undead army rose in the middle of this particular kingdom, and this kingdom doesn't like that. So they came in, and you know what? This is a fascist kingdom or crusading kingdom, and they killed all the undead. And look, now our campaign is controlled by by fascist overlords. Yeah, uh, good job. And, and <laughs> it, it turns out that this culture has very specific burial customs. Yeah. And yeah. they are very, very offended at you, and now you can't come back. Unfortunately, well, you can run away. Your undead can shuffle. <laughs> the knights <laughs> fall upon them, hack them to bits, and you escape. Or you can just turn around and say, hey, this ritual you keep exploiting has actually brought a dark god through. <laughs> Now there is undead. <laughs> Good luck! Yeah, I, I mean, you can always... It, you, you can do what I said, which is kill, or you can do what these guys said, which is basically take the story elements and make more of them out of it, uh, and expand the story from there, and with a little creative RP, you can stop your players from trying to exploit rules, because they will keep running into consequences for their actions. <laughs> it's... And have that, discu and have that discussion after the game. You do. You are the GM. As Mike said, first page of every uh, good, book. good book has that rule for a reason. It's the golden rule of uh, these are guidelines, and you as the GM, the arbitrator, as Derek has, called, has said before. So you are in control during that evening because it's your job to instill fun. And if the player's not having fun because he's being uh, being a jerk, then stop him there and say, "We'll talk about it later." That's like uh, Mike's shirt said during D20 Live 2014. The DM yes, is the DM is always right. right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, we got your question. Next up. Yes, you there. Sorry, I've never met you. Yeah, never met you. No, Back we're not wearing the same bowling shirt, not at all. <laughs> They're different colors, it doesn't count. No, it doesn't. Uh, um, okay, since I've been hearing a lot, it just came up to me halfway through because there's been a lot of questions about uh, difficult players. Yeah. But they're mostly the aggressive types. Uh, I just found that, I never asked before. How do you deal with the shy care, uh, shy players, the ones who are, they want to play, but they seem somewhat intimidated for one reason or another? Shy players are fun. <laughs> um, shy players become your difficult? best players. They're the best players. Remember early Cassie? Oh my god. Because <laughs> shy players, all you have to do is sit down and talk with them about their interests right. for 10 minutes. And you'll be like, okay. And you start throwing it in. And they start reacting to everything. And then as they start reacting in the meta, they start reacting as characters, and that pulls them in really fast. You uh, they have again have that conversation with the character, but don't do it at the table. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if if you realize that they're shy, just um, have them interact with battles or have them interact with scenes, even if it's just one or two lines, so you can get through that session and then talk to them afterwards and say, "What do you want to do with your character? Where is your character going? 
How do you want it to, what, what goals do you have? And then work it in. Use their story as inspiration and give them King Arthur's brother as <laughs> one of their kids. Uh, and it's the, the, the more you actually work with your player to really um, f give them what they're looking for in the game, the less shy they'll be because they'll find it too damn cool here, here. to not do it. Um, do, do, oh yeah, we have that, so it's, it's him. Yeah, uh, just one major question. Uh, right. A friend of mine ca yeah, tends to get really depressed when bad dice rolls go on, and I have no real clue how to talk to him about the whole thing. <laughs> and, and well, so. I'm I don't know, Devin. What do you do for me when I roll any time? I laugh. Yeah, you laugh in my face. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, if your character's got bad luck, you can lighten up on the rolls for them and just let them role play their way through it. Yep. Or if they're role playing really, if they're trying to make up with it like role playing really well, just say, you know what, you really set this up really well. Here's a fuck ton of modifiers. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. go. Uh, well, the, one of the other things, and it, uh, Apocalypse World Engine actually does this really well, yeah. is it doesn't equate a bad roll with failure, it equates a bad roll with complications. Um, is that if I bought your role in Apocalypse Engine, it doesn't mean I fail. It doesn't mean I shoot myself in the foot or fall down a flight of yeah. stairs. It means that um, I may succeed, but there's a complication, uh, a large complication, or I may not hit uh, what I'm aiming for, um, but there's a complication to the story. And that's the thing, is to use dice rolls to influence the story. And too often we look at it as this pure binary of success or fail. It's one or zero. Yeah. But what if we introduce that X factor in the middle where we're more interested in telling the story than in absolute success or failure. Don't say no, say yes, but. Yeah, yes, yes but. but. Uh, next one? This is a little bit of, of a specific one because uh -huh. of the oddities of my players. Uh, <laughs> Don't I, them. I, they chose to be in your basement to hang out. I'm not... I'm not I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> it's not my basement, though. It's well, mine. they chose to be in a room locked with you. Don't <laughs> them. Yeah, I know. Okay. No, no, and I do enjoy it. It's just, I need to uh, stop it. Don't creep him out either. This is a group thing. It's what he does at the table too. It's okay. okay. Yeah, no, it gets worse when I play drag. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I kind of need specific advice on writing a particular kind of character. I am trying to create intelligent boss fights that can't be talked out of being evil every time. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I'd like them to actually fight one of my bosses for once. Yeah, but oh, that's... Okay, okay, okay. um... <laughs> on the one I hand... I have players like, sorry, wait. <laughs> <laughs> See, be grateful. So much shit I'm getting on this panel. Because uh, I like to murder things. Um, that's not a bad thing, honestly. It's not, it's, it's not, I it's, know, it's, I know. You're, you're good. Like uh, but like, you just, just for fun? Yeah. Just make an asshole. Yeah. Here's what: make them. You want to? You really want to get player motivation? Is there an NPC they care about? Kill them <laughs> every time, yeah. or just <laughs> kill your darlings, or give them. Because here's the thing: if you have a guy up on a mountain that's cackling all day long, the players will think he's adorable. Yeah. <laughs> if you have someone who comes in and hurts something they care about, yeah. that is true evil. Joss Whedon. Yeah. Uh, um, to use Harry Potter as an example, no one really hates Voldemort. Everyone hates the chicken pink. I can't remember her name. Umbridge. Bellatrix. Umbridge. Umbridge. Yeah. Everyone hates Umbridge because Umbridge upsets the status quo. She ruins day-to-day -day lives in a very minute way in the grand scheme of things, but she hurts the players on an emotional level. Yeah. You get that kind of villain, they will rip their heart out and drink from it like a chalice. Who do you hate more in Ghostbusters? Do you hate Gozer or do you hate Walter Peck? <laughs> Who, uh, and that's the thing is, bad guys are often to the, the best bad guy that they can't talk out of it is the total prick who is convinced that they're right, will not believe that they are not right, and is an absolute jackass about it. Yeah. And just make it obnoxious, and they won't want to talk the guy out of it. They will want to kill them just to make them shut up and go away. Make Gaston. <laughs> <laughs> Who want a noise PC? It's like Gaston. Um, how do you deal with player balance in terms of one player who might not, whose plot line might start to overwhelm the rest of the story? There's well, yeah, this one's more for me because Devin doesn't know how to do this at all. I do. Yeah, sure. I, I rewrote all of Exalted. I know. To make certain that all the players. Um, sorry. Usually, what you do is you kind of give them a clean slate kind of scenario, yeah. where it's just like. Just something where they're all kind of relatively new on the situation. Nothing where they they all have an equal level of stake in, like, you're on a 
bow traveling somewhere. In this situation, not a lot of you have stakes. Um, if you find one player has too much of a plot line, the other thing you can do is ask the other players, just like, look, you seem to be at the back a little bit. Do you want, is there any kind of plot line you want to do or anything like that? If they say, no, I'm fine at the back, I'm cracking one liners and killing things, then that's all you need to give them. Some players just like me at the back, but you gotta talk. You do. And draw the other players in. Don't even give the player who is grasping for attention a chance to interact. There's nothing wrong with turning to a player who is wanting to insert themselves in every scene or insert themselves in every scenario and say, stop, wait for a second. You're not being rude. Yeah. They're friends, and this is, again, as Derek said, a cooperative story. Yeah. So if this one person is wanting all the attention, you say, I'm going to give you the time. Give me a moment. I'm talking to X, Y, Z player. One of the things that Fiasco does really well as a system is actually specifically moderates that because people have to bid to be part of a scene. Yeah. Um, and that forces people to, con they can't be in every scene. They have to consider what they're going to be in, um, and it makes sure that everyone gets time to be part of the story. Um, and you're go the here's the thing though, you're gonna have strong personalities at the table, you're gonna have weaker personalities or less um, extroverted personalities at the table, and your most extroverted out there players will tend to be the guys that get the most attention, and sometimes for groups, that's okay. But if someone is, uh, but if you as a GM find that someone's not getting attention, ask them. If someone comes to you with an issue about not being able to get some cool stuff, or not being able to occasionally um, get the center, uh, be the center of attention, or feel cool, or feel awesome, you you do need to address that. But sometimes it can be as simple as talking to one player and saying, "Look, man, I need you to back off a bit when Paul's trying to play his character." just to let him shine a little bit. Because we all want to feel awesome. We, this is escapism for us. This is a, an immersive experience. Cool. Does anyone have any more questions? Because we're going to try to go fast because we're in like the last 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a very new player to Dungeons & Dragons, RPG, all that. Yeah. And I have access to all the new Dungeons & Dragons books, but like manuals and all that. But I'm very overwhelmed. A lot of things go over my head. And like I have people who have worked through RPGs with me, but is there somewhere where I could start that would be a little bit easier and like simplified for all like this? Like in terms of like a rule system or? Rule system or just to kind of get more into so you like want to do, Are you looking for a different, are you looking for a different rule system or do you want to stick with D&D &D and are looking for tools to ease into it? Which? Tools to ease into it because okay. like I know like. There, I would Google um, step by step. Pathfinder D D character generator. There are a lot of them online and they will actually lead you screen by screen threads or Excel sheets or HTML pages. And often the good ones will actually have um, text box explanations for how to do it. There is there is nothing wrong when you're running a game with looking your players in the eye and saying, we are just using the core book, guys. We are not using anything other than the core book. Uh, and saying as a GM, this is all I'm familiar with. So it's all we're gonna use. Leave your supplements at home. Mike, I still want to play that gnomish gunslinger that you wouldn't let me play. Um, he was going to be two, a two-foot-tall version of Roland of Gilead. Uh, I know, and Big Mike wouldn't let me play him. Um, I'm always the bad guy. I know. Um, okay, Mike, we appreciate you. Someone has to. But it, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's very easy. Uh, it is. It's really easy to get overwhelmed by the sheer amount of source material out there for the game, and the fact that more experienced or more well-read players will tend to grab the lesser-known books that you have never even heard of before for this one spell or this one class or this one weapon, and it is okay to say, no, this is what I'm comfortable with running. I can run it. Or I don't run anything. Um, and as a player, if you want just like a simple rule system, uh, the fate system's good. Fate, uh, specifically as it's written in Spirit of the Century, yeah, getting fate core can be very confusing at first. Um, I recommend like, I recommend Spirit of the Century. I recommend Scion, especially. Uh, the old system, not the new one, because it's out yet. You just play a child of a god and you make whatever you want. Um, what else is really simple? Um, uh, GURPS and uh, GURPS is actually... Uh, you can't be. It's but simple, but you need a really good DM to do it. You do, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, DC Heroes, if you can find the old Mayfair RPG, has, um, has a beautifully easy system because it's literally 2d10 and two charts, and you're good to go. Oh, big eye, small mouth. Yeah, big, and big eye, small mouth. Yeah. Tristat. Yeah. Yeah. The Tristat system. Tristat's really easy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, does anyone, we're kind of getting at the end, does anyone have just like quick questions, even D20 live questions? All right, I need to see who put that hand up first. Uh, he's been uh, three, oh, three times in. Yeah. yeah. How do you utilize for D20 uh, co-GMs? D20 Live? Yeah. When I get tired, I ask him to GM. <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, because I, because of D20 Live and the very large canon that we're crafting, I've slowly been relinquishing control over to Devin and probably a few of the other guys as time's going to go on. Um, because we're still working out our plot for the next six years? <laughs> yeah, I put a lot of thought into this. Um, are you uh, and are you talking about uh, the game or just D20 Live? Because D20 Live, he's just answered that, but do you mean in terms of a... Uh, well, I just uh, mean for any game utilizing oh, a card oh, Yeah, it's, you, you, very speci you very specifically have uh, set roles. You talk about the session prior to it and say, okay, you're going to take these NPCs or you're going to do the fights or and you just assign things together. You write the story together, talk about it together, and, ass and assign specific NPCs and fights and so forth. That way you can flip back and forth. <laughs> uh, who's next? Who's going to... Blood splatter, this gentleman has to Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah. So everybody's kind of got their own comfort zone, as well as based on systems, obviously, there's sort of yeah. limits. But what, as a DM, is sort of your hard cap or soft cap on player talent? Four. Yeah, four. Uh, four is my magic number, five is a little excessive. Devin likes to do six because he doesn't know how to say no. <laughs> I run a convention game for 200 people once. I ran, I ran. I ran a uh, whole weekend event for twenty-two players. Bad idea. I ran an ongoing Scion game for six players and almost pulled my hair out socially. Four is good because you get everyone interacting. Yeah. Everyone can have personal plot. It's Depending on the game, some games are built um, four to five. Some games, specifically, a lot of White Wolf games are built around the idea that you'll have five people at the yeah. table. Yeah, fair. Yeah. Um, it really depends on the setting and the game. But that's for tabletop. Like I said, LARP, I, I've run a 200 person convention game before. Uh, it's okay if I ask like, a jokey question. Yeah, sure. Uh, I just kind of wanted to know how it felt to have like the most difficult RPG ever written by the guy who wrote the D&D &D at his core be defeated by a cat. <laughs> <laughs> So are you asking, how did it feel to have Fussy Bridges survive? Yes. It's you right. When you see where Fussy Bridges is going in the D20 Live canon, you will know how I feel about it. Okay? That is not... D okay, sorry guys. Fussy Bridges is not showing up this year in the proper game. Sorry. She's busy. Oh, oh shit. He didn't even let me use Fussy Bridges in the live stream. That was very sad. The live stream that I ran. That was Because she's busy. She can't have two Infinity Stones. Why not? Wait, what? She's overpowered. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have something planned. Oh, yeah, go ahead. What's the most shenanigan thing you've ever done? <laughs> you go first. What's the most what? Shenanigans thing you've ever done. So I ran a game called Survivor of the Whole, which is all about a sci-fi reality show set about 3,000 years in the future on a planet full of garbage, where I dumped uh, four sociopaths and told them that they had to survive. Um, so we had Big Mike playing, jo basically playing Johnny Gat, Connell Macbeth, aka now Dr. Terawatt, formerly Dr. Holocaust, playing Riddick, um, Tom White playing a crazy bounty hunter who thought he was an alien, and Steve Saylor playing Russell Hant the 1004th, <laughs> um, who is just a career survivor. And it was them essentially versus an army of production assistants. Because that was pretty much the game, was just them torturing the NPCs. Yeah. Um, the most insane character I have who's still alive to this day, against all odds, is my Pathfinder ninja named Matthias, who plays in his Pirates game. Matthias is a ninja who grew up in a ninja, in like a full ninja thing and lived a very rigorous and very monastic life and then learned piracy existed and took to it like oil and fire. So in one instance, he got sh he's gotten shot a lot with poison arrows because he keeps forgetting to check for traps. So finally we find this evil demonic ship and he sneaks on and he avoids all the traps and it's perfect. And he gets to the captain's log which has all the captain's records and opens it up. Arcane Blast. Robert. Am I alive? How are you still alive? <laughs> I come what, back to the what, captain, what, I just what? rip the 
journal for my chest, got the book, Captain. <laughs> and the other one is Douglas. Yes. <laughs> shenanigans wise, what about Nauticus? Nauticus isn't shenanigans. Nauticus is something else. <laughs> He's a gift. Yes. And I'm taking him back to D20 Live. Nauticus is a glorious thing. Um, again, I don't play a lot of games. Uh, I mostly, most of my playing came from LARPing, which is why I did LARPing, so I could play because most of my tabletop is uh, GMing. My, my most shenanigans GM character, took me a while to remember this, was a mechanic in a Mutants and Masterminds game. Uh, is he, he was a complete improvised character because Mike needed to get his motorbike repaired. Uh, and, and I decided to be horribly uh, racist. racist, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> I had had a lot to drink, um, and he, he was essentially a bad uh, Chinese stereotype mechanic pulled out of a lot of different anime sources and literary sources who had a son that he decided to replace his foot with a wheel, but the opposite foot with a peg, so he ever and actually, never actually went anywhere because he turned around in a circle, um, <laughs> and it was, but it was, and it was a counterclockwise circle because he didn't actually get the wheel working properly, so it was only ever a counterclockwise circle, he didn't turn around. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, yeah, it just uh, it, every single thing that Mike fed me, he was asked, "What does he look like? How does he act?" <laughs> was just this horribly racist man who called you a bishi and all sorts of different things. Yes, those, the, yeah, that was my worst. So I, it is two o'clock, so we are unfortunately out of time. See you all tonight. You will. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for participating in our first the D20 Life first panel. Would you like to promote any other panels right there? <laughs> I want so many panels now. You guys missed my cool panel at 9.30 this morning when I did Saturday morning cartoons. That's not yes. a cool panel. That's hey, a I was there. Shut up. Shut your lying commie mouth. Uh, you can check me out on uh, on YouTube, Derek the Bard. You can also check out the Terrible Warriors at TerribleWarriors.com. And I think I'm done. <laughs> um, I'm Big Mike 404s. I have a 404s new format fiasco at 3.30 today, if my health holds up. And of course, there is D20 Live tonight at 9 o'clock. And yeah, if you guys have more questions for us, talk to us on Twitter, on the D20 Live Facebook, or ask us at the con if we're not running around somewhere. Thank you very much for participating. Peace. See ya.